thank you for this very generous invitation and for the opportunity to speak with you today as part of this conference examining what the European Year of Cultural Heritage might mean for the professionals who define and safeguard this legacy. My name is Ellen Harrington. I'm delighted to be representing the Deutsches Film Institute and Film Museum, which is based in Frankfurt, Germany, as the new director since January of this year. And if you look in your gift bag, you'll see a nice little publication that gives you an overview of our collections and our activities. Um, the Deutsches Film Institute and Film Museum is a member of the German Digital Library, um, a host organization of this conference, and we also maintain the European Film Gateway platform for Europeana. So it's wonderful to be among so many dedicated professional colleagues. Um, as you can tell, I am not German. I'm coming from Los Angeles, where I previously spent two decades at the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. Previously, I worked in the film industry in feature film development after studying film history and theory. So I have a foot in both worlds, as it were, preservation and production. And with regard to film, it is essential, I think, to understand the mechanisms of both in order to ensure that the essential work of collecting and protecting film heritage can be accomplished. It's been a fascinating process for me to become embedded, as it were, in a German cultural organization. I'd worked for two decades with the Deutsches Film Institute and Film Museum as an exhibition and collections curator from my own institution and as a partner with numerous other German and European and international film organizations, art museums, archives, and other uh, creative institutions on collaborative projects. But the view from inside is always different. Um, and it's been remarkable to learn more about the specific networks, strategies, partnerships, and especially the funding support that is structurally available for this work of digitization and preservation here in Germany and in Europe. It certainly differs from my experience of the United States, and I'll elaborate on that further as I proceed. However, I feel it's also first essential to explore the notion of film as an art form, since the concept of film actually existing as an art and cultural product worthy of these efforts has not always been a given and has been contested territory. Film is fundamentally a different physical medium than most of the traditional art forms that are enshrined in our cultural institutions. Younger than the fine arts of drawing and painting, which are preserved by museums, or literature preserved in libraries, film was essentially at first a documentary medium, then a populist entertainment, not viewed especially by its makers as a form of high art production. Its ephemera, such as scripts, production and costume designs, props and other artifacts are now highly prized, but even today, they're viewed as work product by the motion picture craftspeople who actually produce them and therefore considered disposable. Um, in this way, perhaps, um, the archiving of these ephemera are more akin to the archives dedicated to saving the production histories of performing arts such as ballet, theater, and live music. So film occupies a middle ground where decisions must be made about which objects should be considered worthy of preservation under the standards of cultural heritage. Certainly, I would not argue that every film, just like every painting, is deserving and each work must meet an aesthetic or culturally relevant threshold um, in order to be included in the chosen few that can be preserved by institutions. Then the elements that comprise the original work and the documentation of that process, along with the ephemera created, must be considered. What exactly is the work of art? Is it the final release print that you could see in a theater? The original negative? Perhaps a later or suppressed director's cut? that brings the vision of the director to life, which wasn't permitted under the economic constraints of a studio system. If it's a silent film, how do we approach producing new music to accompany the film? Is the contemporary score appropriate? Is it preferable to try to use source music from the historical period? How do you reconstruct missing intertitles? Which documents or uh, which documentaries or animated works meet our criteria? The ethics of the process have profound implications for which materials will survive for future generations to experience. The mechanics of film were invented in a technology race, not unlike the development of today's computer and cell phone technology. 
Who would win, Android or Apple, Edison or Lumiere? And ultimately, who would have access to and control of the production process and the content that these delivery devices could provide to the public? Motion picture technology was largely invented by Europeans, but the film industry ultimately became most dominant in the United States, and in particular in Hollywood. This was not a given in the early decades of film. Um, there were strong industries existing in France, Germany, Sweden, the UK, among many other places, and silent films traveled quite easily because of intertitles. Two major disruptive events shifted the focus toward Hollywood. The advent of sound, which disenfranchised a large cast of international performers and filmmakers in Los Angeles, and World War II, which curtailed European production and caused an exodus of talent that took many, many post-war years to re reconstruct. Cinema in those years, however, was primarily considered an entertainment medium. And while many critics have since dubbed film the defining art form of the 20th century, the film industry itself has had a very uneasy relationship with the difference, based largely on enormous economic factors, the balance between show business and high art. It was again Europeans, primarily the French in the 1950s and 60s, who defined the intellectual parameters by which movies became cinema. This was also the era in which the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences established a regular award for best foreign language film, otherwise a film not made in English, which initially was only an honorary award and first given to several Italian neorealist productions. Europe has also been the leader in institutionalizing the notion that cinema and its artifacts are worth preserving. Following the lead of Henri Langlois and the Cinémathèque Française, national archives and an astonishing number of film museums were established across Europe during the mid to late 20th century. In Frankfurt, where the Deutsches Film Museum was established in 1984 as part of a very ambitious civic a uh, project to establish a museum's ufer on the banks of the Main River, I am constantly telling people that not every city is as fortunate as they to have a museum dedicated to the art of film. When the Academy was founded in 1927 as a professional trade organization by a group of studio moguls and a few craftspeople, building a museum was one of their stated goals. This was an effort to gain some respect for their business. And the fact of it being a business, often associated with people of dubious moral character, such as actors, and a large, largely Jewish executive class, meant that respectability was often an issue. Numerous failed efforts to build a film museum in Los Angeles followed over nearly a century, and it's just now, literally, that the Academy's long-awaited Museum of Motion Pictures is completing construction. And in contrast to many European examples, such as Frankfurt, where the city cultural office founded the film museum, the Academy, as well as the also under construction Lucas Museum of Narrative Arts are entirely privately financed. And the Lucas Museum is an interesting example. George Lucas, of course, his family foundation is funding this to the tune of $1.3 billion. No civic money is being used. And yet, both Chicago and San Francisco turned this museum down, and Los Angeles accepted it. I don't think that that would happen in Europe. This duality, navigating the notion of film as commercial product versus cultural and artistic artifact, has been one of the key factors, I would argue, in the systematic loss of American film heritage throughout the decades. The costs of production in the US have typically been so high and the risk of distribution losses equally fraught that only the most commercially successful works were systematically preserved, largely because future income could be produced and derived from re-releases in various formats. The materiality of the film production process also presents tremendous challenges for those of us willing to engage in its preservation. There are numerous iterations of a motion picture, from the camera negative through dupe negatives to badly scratched release prints. How do you obtain the best possible elements from which to create your restoration or your digital scan? Sometimes you don't have a choice. The business practices of studios and filmmakers have rarely taken long-term preservation into account when short-term economic gain is prioritized. For some releases, thousands of film prints were traditionally made 
and then after the run of the movie, traditionally destroyed. Sometimes only one or two reference prints were saved by the studio or production company, but often the prints disappeared after they completed their scheduled shipping itinerary, which was progressively farther across the country or internationally away from Los Angeles. And of course, those of you in archives know, storage space and costs are not just a problem for us. Studios have regularly purged film prints that they felt would never be requested for future screenings or programs. Many great titles have literally been rescued by a devoted category of private collector who haunt the alleys and raid the dumpsters behind the film studios and depots of Los Angeles and New York. Occasionally, a major discover is made, discovery is made in a very far off archive. Um, in New Zealand, for example, where a lost for, uh, film of John Ford's was found recently after the, the local projectionist who decades ago failed to ship the print back to Los Angeles following its commercial run there. This success story is relatively rare, however, and is actually made international news headlines. In the normal course of doing business, nearly 90% of films made in the silent era and approximately 50% of the films made since then have simply disappeared. Many of them we know about because of paper records, newspaper reviews, and things like that, but we can document these tremendous losses by number. The numbers are significantly worse for independent films, documentaries, experimental, and animated films, and the problem persists in the extreme even today. Because while digital production and its relative affordability is making it easier for more films to be made by more people, it is also far harder to archive and preserve objects that are born digital. Ironically, good old-fashioned celluloid is the best preservation medium for moving images, which can last 100 years. So scanning and digital preservation excels as a distribution and access medium, but ironically, it is imperfect as an archival standard. This is the landscape against which we do our work, and the differences between the US and Europe are startling. While the US does have a national archive in the form of the Library of Congress, there is no systematic collection of produced works. Donations come to the Library of Congress and other archives generally by luck. 25 years ago, the library initiated a very highly visible national registry for significant film titles, and each year, a blue ribbon panel designates 25 titles as cultural treasures for the country. The list is often bold and diverse, with numerous genres and decades represented. What is sadly not known, or widely publicized, is that the list has no practical effect. The titles are merely recommended for preservation, but no actual budget or mechanism is in place for collecting these works and ensuring their safety and longevity. I also don't think that would happen in Europe, I hope to think. Studios themselves have restoration departments with dedicated staff who try mightily to save as much of their studio's heritage as possible. But generally, their priorities have been determined by the business departments, which focus on digital restorations of well-known titles to coincide with major anniversaries. These are structured as business opportunities for re-releases and home video sales, but with the home video market now in sharp decline, resources are drying up for this essential work. There are a few privately funded archives in the United States that collect, preserve, and restore a wide variety of motion picture heritage, usually based in cultural organizations in universities, such as UCLA, Harvard, the George Eastman House, and the Academy. These entities often partner with the film studios on their restoration projects, bringing money and expertise to the process for films for which they will never own the rights or control the distribution. With the additional impediment of rights clearances and intellectual property, nonprofit arts organizations must take a hard look at their priorities. What are the incentives for cultural heritage organizations to invest their own or public money in the preservation process, especially because the costs of rest restoration or digital preservation run into the tens and often hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's a very expensive process. In the United States, the situation remains very complicated with regard to partnerships with commercial entities. 
And of course, there are numerous orphan films that fall out of distribution or had unsecure conditions from the very start, such as most documentaries, independent features, exper experimental or animated films, which may not even have a distributor. Often these films have very little chance of survival, but occasionally success stories do emerge, especially if far-sighted filmmakers have made the effort to collect their own film elements and deposit them with an archive before the material has had a chance to degrade. At my new institution, the Deutsches Film Institute and Film Museum, our film archive has undertaken numerous significant restorations. Um, but in order to receive the public funding that makes that possible, we also must secure the rights. We are, therefore, also in the rights clearance as well as the distribution business. The International Archives Federation, or FIAF, has numerous strong European member archives, and most of them have direct mandates and funding to collect and preserve the national heritage of their countries. The British Film Institute, Cinémathèque Française, Cinéthèque de Bologna, the I Film Museum in Amsterdam, the Danish Film Institute, the Stiftung Deutsche Kinematik and Bundesarchiv here in Berlin, as well as we in Frankfurt at the Deutsches Kinematik, our Deutsches Film Institute and Film Museum are strongly networked with our fellow film organizations across every continent. Education and mentoring programs for emerging archives is one of the strongest joint activities we engage in. One of the most helpful functions of the FIAF is the ability to send e-blasts to all the members stating that an archive has discovered some film elements in their vaults but needs the collaboration of others in order to find missing reels or other components. At the closing, or sometimes the opening credits, of most film restorations, you'll start to notice complicated texts appearing, describing the mix of original and reconstructed elements that were utilized to assemble the completed motion picture you have seen. They're often true detective stories. Um, this is not work that can be done in isolation, and not even with individual countries. As you'll see most often, numerous archives are credited as partners in this process. The best elements, expertise, or digital lab may lie outside your own borders, and the strong collaboration and high level of communication between European archives has impressed me greatly. The Association of Cinémathèque Européenne, or ACE, with many of the same members I mentioned, plus nearly 40 others, have joined together to work on numerous European-level projects, many of them digital platforms, such as the European Film Gateway featured in Europeana. These digital projects are providing preservation and curatorial content while opening the doors to the archives for a wider public. We must continue these joint efforts because without a dynamic relationship to the broader public, our work exists in a vacuum. We must explore shared digital platforms, streaming opportunities, formalized educational curriculum, and other innovations beyond the traditional film festival and cinematech preservations of the, or presentations of these digital films. These works will live not because they are digitized and living in a hard drive in our archive building, but because we are actively promoting access, reaching out, and drawing people into the art of cinema. There is significant national support here in Germany for film preservation and digitization. Digitization offers many opportunities for access as the number of digitized films increases and new platforms and educational initiatives will need to be developed. Media literacy and the understanding of how images um, construct narratives and meaning is the key for coming generations in this media-saturated world. Our education department at the Film Museum is working regionally, nationally, and with numerous European partners to develop programs and curriculum to bring young audiences into contact with the notion of film as an art form, rather than purely as an entertainment medium, and to encourage interactions with unfamiliar forms, such as experimental film, and even the dreaded black and white film. A bold new initiative was publicly announced last week, which, uh, through which a partnership of the FFA, the Federal Film Funding Agency here, the BKM, the Federal Cultural Ministry, and the German states are supporting a 10-year, 100 million euro initiative to digitize the national film heritage of Germany. As the film archival community here in Germany determines its priorities and applies for the funding, 
We are working closely together across institutions through our association, the Kinematexverbund, to assure that we are all rowing in the same direction. We will work to review Germany's list of significant film titles and prioritize the digitization of as many of these films as possible in an effort to ensure we don't repeat the mistake of the Library of Congress. And we are honored at the Deutsches Film Institute and Film Museum that the publicly available database portal for which we are responsible, Film Portal DE, will be charged with the responsibility of documenting this landmark digitization initiative. I'll make one more bold statement before I conclude with regard to the long-term survival of cinema. While I don't believe it would be impossible in my home country, the US, given the entrenched commercial interests inherent in film production, I do believe that country by country here in Europe, mandatory deposit of film production in the National Archives should be enacted, as well as copyright permission for educational use. I think these things are embedded in each other and essential. If all films, not just those that are collected because these receive some share of their production funding from government money, were systematically archived, a lot of the loss and archival challenges that I've described of the history of cinema could be avoided in the future. And the wonderful new films that are yet to be made would not face these dire odds of survival. Thank you.